Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. It is Monday, January 25th, 2021, so buckle up. Hit that like button and let's just jump into the news of the day so you can get back to yours. And where we'll start today is with entertainment slash entertainer news, starting with Jojo Siwa. And Siwa, if you don't know, is a massively successful creator, both in numbers of followers and views, but also business. She's one of the most economically successful creators out there. I mean, in addition to a number of revenue streams, it's been reported that she has sold over 80 million bows. But the reason that Siwa was trending into and over the weekend is that she just recently came out. She had been hinting, kind of teasing, that on Friday she posted a photo saying my cousin got me a new shirt that shirt saying best gay cousin ever i have never ever ever been this happy before and it feels really awesome and i've been happy for a little bit now and it's just so 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 awesome also in the video saying she's not labeling her sexuality specifically yet and the reason why i'm not ready to say this answer is because i don't really know this answer i want to i want to share everything with the world i really do but i also want to keep things in my life private until they're ready to be public but i right now what matters is that you guys know that no matter who you love that it's okay. I know for a number of people watching, you may be thinking, is this really that big of a deal? Is it important that she did it? I would actually argue yes. Even though there is obviously a difference coming out today compared to that maybe of 20 plus years ago, it still matters. And as Sarah Kate Ellis, the, the president of GLAAD explained, JoJo's decision to share her truth with the world is a powerful moment. As one of the most influential young role models today, JoJo's story is a reminder for LGBTQ youth to love who they are and to find safe and welcoming environments to speak out. And as much as maybe in you and I's day-to-day -day life, it's not that big of a deal for someone to come out as gay or, or to be gay. That's not everyone's experience based on where they live. And so I think when any celebrity can use their spotlight to take away the stigma from something that people are just born a certain way, that is great and that is amazing because there are a lot of people in this world that do not feel comfortable in their skin because they were raised to feel like who they are on the inside is wrong. Ignorance and bigotry is still around despite that, you know, we want to pat ourselves on the back for being so different than those in the past. Unfortunately, that was not the only reason JoJo was in the news. After all this news happened, she ended up getting swatted. And in Alive, people have been saying it seemed like JoJo was implying that the media actually swatted her so she had to leave her house and people could take photos. Though, and it's not a contest, but if you thought swatting was bad, I mean, we should talk about Roman Atwood. He, of course, one of the early big prank YouTubers then becoming a massively loved family vlogger. He and his wife over the weekend made headlines because they finally made a video addressing why they've been so quiet on the platform for the past year and explaining that they were dealing with stalkers. We have left out of the fear of our life literally the safety of our kids like our house are everything we have going on to say that what happened went above and beyond the creepy things that many people in the public eye have to deal with and that it was extreme severe harassment also sharing a handful of the terrible things that have happened you have to have a funeral for somebody that you love these stalkers bomb threaded funeral literally in our vehicles like shutting our vehicles on and off and powering them on and off and setting the alarm off while we're just sitting at home with our kids like the alarm in our house they turn the power off to our home this home they have turned they turn the power off in the middle of the winter. They also said the stalkers did things like canceling their car insurance without them knowing, sending pictures from the security cameras to their cell phones, changing their mail and sending threatening texts, including death threats, but also saying that this only kind of scratches the surface. Also thanking the FBI for helping them through this and saying that they finally feel that there's a light at the end of the tunnel for them. So obviously uh, we'll wait to see if any other information comes out, but I, I kind of want to end this on two notes. One. I feel horrible for Roman and his family for having to deal with this. No one should have to deal with this. And two, if it can even be thought of as the slightest bit of a silver lining, I will say I feel a little bit hopeful. In the past, it feels like when I would cover something where something bad would happen uh, to a celebrity because of something with fans or something like that, people would have this mindset of, hey, well, that's just part of the cost of being famous. But one of the biggest things I've seen from Roman sharing this story is the amount of empathy and sympathy. And that makes me the slightest bit hopeful. That makes me feel like people, as, as we all get more accustomed to the internet, aren't fully losing the fact that the other person on the other end, despite uh, the success or, or whatever else they have, that they are still a human being, that they should still be afforded human decency. And then let's talk about big business news, starting with GameStop. So this is actually a wild 
story. So, so during the pandemic last year, GameStop stock was around four or five dollars. Then around August of last year, it starts going up and up and up. Beginning of January this year, it, it's actually close to twenty dollars. Two of the key things to know about GameStop is that there are a lot of short sellers that think that because of the pandemic, the company is overvalued, that the the price will go down. And then two, there are a lot of people in the subreddit Wall Street Bets that really love GameStop. And so reportedly, to mess with the people who are shorting the stock, that think the stock will go down, you have a a ton of people on Wall Street bets pushing for others to purchase the stock. This ultimately brings us to last Thursday where you have short seller Andrew Left of Citron Research releasing a video saying this is why GameStop should be a $20 stock. That then seemed to lead to two different things. One, uh, he actually pulled back and claimed that he and his family have been threatened because of that video. And two, people kept buying more and more GameStop shares. Jumping from $41 last Thursday to $140 today. That is until it then plummeted to about half of that amount, 70, and as of recording, it's around $77. And as far as my personal opinion on this, I'm just, I'm fascinated. I, I, I'm so interested to see where GameStop's gonna be a week from now, as well as just a month from now. Right, this feels very much like that potentially boom and or bust volatility that comes with crypto. A lot of people gain and a lot of people have loss. And so it'll be interesting to see how long-term versus short-term all of this is. Especially since uh, I've seen from a lot of people online, part of the reason they did this wasn't just to try and make money, but it was to kind of give the middle finger to short sellers, who, while this is obviously still a developing situation today, I'm recording while the market's still open, we have a long week ahead of us. I mean, on Friday alone, it was reported that short sellers had lost $1.6 billion. I, for one, though, and I'm not a, an advisor in any way, I'm going to be staying away. Anytime I see massive waves, I, I just get scared because uh, I... <laughs> I have this fun habit of anytime I pay attention to a wave, it lands on my head. I'm all about that long and boring life. Then let's talk about Uber, who after buying Postmates reportedly laid off 185 people from the Postmates division. Reportedly, that's about 15% of Postmates total workforce with most of the app's executive team not returning, including its founder and CEO, Bastian Lehman. But do not fret, your prayers for the billionaires have been heard and a number of the executives will reportedly be leaving with multi-million dollar exit packages. Also, as far as why we're seeing these cuts, it's believed that this is part of a larger plan to better integrate Postmates infrastructure with Uber Eats. And this is an area that Uber has been looking to grow, right? They, they tried and failed to buy Grubhub, then purchasing Postmates for $2.65 billion. And food delivery has been seen as a crucial move for Uber since its ride sharing business has been suffering because of the pandemic. And the more that you look at the company, the more it becomes apparent that they're kind of consolidating, changing things up in order to be profitable by the end of 2021. Hell, uh, back in December, Uber sold the autonomous vehicle segment to Aurora Innovation and sold their Uber Elevate flying taxi division to Joby Aviation. We also had space SpaceX in the news because they launched 143 satellites into orbit on Sunday, breaking the record for the most satellites lifted into space in a single launch. And notably, this launch was the first of SpaceX's dedicated rideshare program, SmallSat Rideshare, which is basically like a carpool for satellites. It's this recent innovation that came in response to growing demands for low-cost access to space by smaller companies and institutions. And while this new launch is definitely seen and being hailed as a success, it's also triggered conversations about the increasing number of satellites congesting low Earth orbit, with many experts fearing that overcrowding could create a rise in potentially catastrophic orbital collisions and dangerous levels of space debris. And so now, many are calling for regulations to be put into place. In fact, uh, NASA's Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel wrote in its 2020 annual report, given the recent increase in non-traditional commercial space operations, including satellite servicing, space tourism, and the deployment of large numbers of satellites to provide worldwide internet access, updates to existing roles and responsibilities may be appropriate. As things stand today, there are no clear lines of authority for directing coherence among the many entities that operate in space. And to that, I say there's only one obvious solution, space wars. You make all these companies vying for internet dominance, make military vehicles, boom, instant government funding, and then every week, 8 p.m. Eastern, space wars. Or more communication and regulation, but I'm still vying for space wars. And from that, let's take a second to pay some bills and thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, nordvpn.com slash phil. You know, it's safe to say over the last year or so, our internet usage has gone up. You know, whether you're working from home or you're maxing out streaming services, you are definitely not alone. NordVPN is an easy and affordable way to start securing your time on the internet and reclaiming access to your personal data. They also fantastically have great security tools like NordPass Password Manager that stores your passwords in the cloud, all your passwords encrypted on all your devices and for your eyes 
only. So hey, head on over to nordvpn.com slash phil and get a huge discount on a two-year plan. And when you use my code phil, you also get an extra month for free. And it is risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. So what are you waiting for? That is nordvpn.com slash phil. And don't forget to use code phil at checkout. Then an important international news, we should talk about how Russia experienced some of their largest protests in years this past Saturday. This, of course, after Russian opposition figure Alexei Navalny called for them following his arrest last week. And so we saw tens of thousands taking to the streets, clashing with police in more than 100 cities with independent monitors claiming that 3,500 people were detained by police. And among those 3,500, you had Yulia Navalnaya, Alexei's wife, who was targeted by authorities during the protest, although, according to Russian media, she has since been released. Despite all these protests being declared illegal, they had a lot of reach, and very notably, over one-third of the protesters in Moscow said that they had never protested before, which is definitely huge, but it is also hard to say how the protest popularity will turn into real political power. Right? Because these protests were from across the political spectrum, from far left groups to nationalists, meaning they may oppose Putin and wide-scale corruption in Russia, but they might agree on very little else. But the protests also were a swing in how Russian authorities deal with Navalny. In the past, they've never mentioned him by name. However, this weekend he was on everyone's lips. With the newscasters there airing multiple programs trying to discredit him, painting him as a tool of the West. With Putin himself also having to deny some of Navalny's claims about him, such as that he has a secret billion dollar villa on the coast of the Black Sea. As far as Navalny himself, he's still in jail pending court proceedings on February 2nd, and if those go poorly, he could be in prison until the mid-2020s. However, if anything, he seems more concerned about the immediate future, telling supporters on Friday that he has no intention of suicide. In addition to opponents of the Kremlin just somehow getting poisoned, you know, it happens. Suicide is also a common fate for critics of Putin. Then in news about Rudy Giuliani, who is a real human person and not a fascist robot with an oil leak problem? Just today, we saw Dominion Voting Systems filing a defamation lawsuit against Rudy Giuliani, seeking $1.3 billion in damages for false claims that he made about the company. Dominion, which is one of the largest voting machine manufacturers in the United States, of course, became the main target for widespread election fraud conspiracies spread by Giuliani and other Trump allies. Where people who falsely claimed with zero evidence that Dominion machines widely used in key battlegrounds were flipping votes from Trump to Biden. So now you have the company claiming that Giuliani and his allies, quote, manufactured and disseminated the big lie, which foreseeably went viral and deceived millions of people into believing that Dominion had stolen their votes and fixed the election. With the lawsuit alleging that he did this in part to enrich himself through legal fees and his podcast, noting that Trump's top lawyer reportedly demanded $20,000 per day for his legal services to the president, and arguing that he cashed in by hosting a podcast where he exploited election falsehoods to market things like gold coins, supplements, cigars, and more. The 107-page suit also specifically outlines more than 50 statements Giuliani made on Twitter, his podcast to the conservative media, and during legislative hearings. And notably, the company points out that he never mentioned Dominion in court, where arguably he could face legal ramifications because he knew what he was claiming was a lie. But despite that, Giuliani continued to push the false narrative, even after Dominion sent him a letter in December warning that they would take legal action against him. Also, very significantly, the lawsuit also links Giuliani's false claims about Dominion to the Capitol insurrection, pointing out that he mentioned the company while speaking at the rally before the attack and on social media numerous times during the attack. But also, I mean, even according to reports, even after that, he has still continued to spread those lies as recently as last week. The lawsuit going on to say that as a result of these statements peddled by Giuliani and others, Dominion's founder and employees have been harassed and received death threats, and Dominion has suffered unprecedented and irreparable harm. Now, notably, this is also not the first defamation suit Dominion has filed against Trump allies in recent weeks. Earlier this month, the company filed a similar claim against Sidney Powell, where it also saw $1.3 billion in damages over her claims that Dominion was part of a worldwide communist plot to rig the election. Separately, one of the company's top executives also filed suits against Giuliani, the Trump campaign, and several pro-Trump media outlets after he was forced into hiding due to conspiracies that he masterminded the plot to steal the election. And one of the biggest things here is this could all just be the start. According to reports, an attorney for Dominion said that it was possible that the company would file additional lawsuits against pro-Trump media outlets such as Fox News and even potentially with Trump himself. Then in President Biden news, let's talk about two key things today. First up, you had Biden signing an executive order overturning Trump's ban on transgender Americans serving in the military. That ban, as Axios explained, allowed the military to bar openly transgender recruits and discharge people for not living as their sex assigned at birth. Reportedly, this is something that had affected up to 15,000 service members. So you have that big news, and then the news that Biden has now reimposed a broad travel ban aimed at curbing the spread of the coronavirus. And the specific ban in question was initially imposed by Trump 
around preventing non-citizens who have traveled from Brazil, Ireland, the UK, and 26 other European countries in the last 14 days from entering the United States. Though, despite Trump putting it into place, during his last two days, he issued a proclamation ordering the ban to end on January 26th, when the CDC starts requiring passengers from abroad to present proof of a negative coronavirus test before boarding a flight. Right, so it's set to end tomorrow, but Biden's order, according to CDC officials, will roll back that decision and keep the initial restrictions in place. In fact, it's being reported that Biden will also be adding people who have recently been to South Africa to the travel ban. This decision coming as part of the new administration's much more aggressive approach to fighting the coronavirus, which so far seems to be popular. For example, in an ABC News Ipsos poll released yesterday, they found that 69% of Americans approve of Biden's COVID-19 response so far. And actually, where we'll end today's show is on the note of COVID-19. The number of confirmed cases in the United States has now surpassed 25 million. President Biden also saying in a speech on Friday that he expects the death toll to eventually top 600,000. Though the number of cases per day in the United States does appear to be falling for now. However, health officials have warned against celebrating just yet. For one, daily death rates remain high, and two, COVID variants could upend any ground gained if people do not stay vigilant. That news is also why we've seen such a mixed reaction to what's happening out here in California. This is because California Governor Gavin Newsom lifted regional stay-at-home orders across the state today. That news first coming after a letter from the California Restaurant Association to its members leak. Notably, what this move does is that it gives way for restaurants in the state to resume in-person dining, gyms, hair salons, and nail salons could also reopen. It appears that this move may be connected to ICU capacity. Like the rest of the United States, California has started to see a steady decline in the number of coronavirus cases being confirmed each day. In San Francisco, for example, ICU capacity has surged to 23% this weekend. However, also like the rest of the United States, daily death rates remain high. A number of other regions in the state also have had less notable success. But according to the LA Times, a Newsom administration official has said that models project ICU capacity for areas with less success, increasing about 15% over the next four weeks. Now, as more and more people get vaccinated, there of course is the hope that we will continue to see a decline in the numbers. But also there is concern for reasons like on Sunday, CDC Director Rochelle Walensky told Fox News that the federal government doesn't know how much coronavirus vaccine the country has. And adding, if I can't tell it to you, then I can't tell it to the governors and I can't tell it to the state health officials. If they don't know how much vaccine they're getting, not just this week, but next week and the week after, they can't plan. They can't figure out how many sites to roll out. They can't figure out how many vaccinators that they need. And they can't figure out how many appointments to make for the public. And in that interview, Walensky noted that the problem is just one of those challenges we've been left with in the transition from the Trump administration. And notably here, this challenge specifically could hamper Biden's efforts to vaccinate 100 million Americans in his first 100 days. According to the CDC so far, just under 22 million doses have been administered, but we've also seen reports that tens of thousands of people with appointments to get the COVID-19 vaccine have had to have them canceled because states are running out of supplies. Though we saw Walensky say she is hopeful that the production of the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines will increase after Biden's first 100 days. Also saying that she's hopeful that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine as well as the AstraZeneca vaccine could soon see emergency approval from the FDA. And where I'll close this story is the light at the end of the tunnel is there. Stay smart, stay safe. Ugh. One day in the near future, we will get to stop saying, once COVID is over, I will blank. And that day cannot come soon enough. Can't wait to go back to being an introvert by choice. And whether it be this final story or anything that stuck out to you, I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below. But uh, that is where I'm going to end today's show. Thank you, of course, for being a part of my daily dives in the news. I love having you. Also, if you're looking for more to watch, I actually put out two videos on Friday. I was like, I don't normally post this day, so let's do it twice. But yeah, like I said at the end of last, Last year. I I'm tweaking things with the schedule, not forcing shows. But yeah, that's it. You've just been filled in with news that matters for people that care. I'll see you tomorrow.